Hello, my name is uh, Timo Kosmanen. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Turku. And in this talk, I'm talking about how to improve out of sample predictive power in the stoned method. So I will start with the empirical motivation that arises from the incentive regulation of electricity distribution firms here in Finland. So then from a methodological point of view, the, the stoned estimation uh, is combining some key elements of uh, data development analysis and stochastic frontier analysis in a, in a coherent unified framework. And I will, I will briefly uh, explain how we do that. Uh, then I will move on to some recent advances in the literature of convex regression, particularly some uh, useful regularizations to alleviate overfitting. And I will explain also how do we understand overfitting in this present context. But I will also uh, introduce a well-known tool called weight restrictions in the in the DEA literature in this new context of of, uh, of uh, alleviating overfitting. Then I will briefly describe uh, how can we assess out of sample predictive power in the present context, and then uh, go to some concluding remarks. So let's start with the empirical motivation. So I need to highlight that uh, that um, uh, regarding the electricity uh, industry. So my focus will be on particularly on the electricity distribution. So there will be not any kind of uh, generation of uh, electric power. That's a completely separate uh, industry nowadays in in Finland and uh, other other northern Europe. Uh, uh, so there is uh, this kind of natural monopolies in the in the electricity transmission and distribution, and in Finland this uh, this uh, uh, transmission and distribution sector is divided so that we have a national monopoly called Fingrid operating this kind of uh, uh, very high voltage uh, transmission, and then then it's also also we have uh, ten uh, regional high voltage uh, operators. But uh, what we are mainly focusing on today is the this uh, uh, eighty local monopolies uh, that uh, that uh, do this kind of uh, distribution of electricity to the final final consumers, including households and firms. And uh, this uh, distribution sector is very heterogeneous in Finland. We have some some very large companies uh, covering very large geographic areas, as you can see on the map on the right. Then we have smaller firms uh, which only focus on a, on a specific town or, or city. And then of course, sizes of these cities and towns vary also. So this is very, very heterogeneous sector. Also in terms of ownership, some are municipality owned companies. Some are uh, have this kind of uh, large scale international investors such as pension funds owning, owning these kind of assets. So therefore, uh, it's very important to have efficient regulation of this industry. And the fact that we have uh, 80, so relatively many local monopolies in this uh, in this industry opens the door for the so-called yardstick competition. So since these companies don't really meet any, any real competition in the market, everybody has the monopoly right in their local uh, jurisdiction. But uh, with the yardstick competition, these companies are then forced to this kind of virtual competition in the in terms of the costs. So how this yardstick has evolved over time uh, here in Finland. Uh, so the yardstick uh, elements were introduced in uh, in the systematically in since two thousand five, uh, when the when the regulation started with using the data development analysis method, which is the the method of choice by many many regulator, regulators around the world. But uh, very quickly in Finland, then, then uh, there was a need to introduce some stochastic elements to the to the to the yardstick. So in the second regulation period since 2008, uh, the Finnish regulator applied the average of the DEA and SFA efficiency scores in the in as a yardstick. So I became involved in uh, in this uh, development of the regulation methods in uh, 2010 when we started to work to uh, develop uh, uh, regulation methods for the third period that started in uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, at that stage, then uh, 
uh, we introduced the so-called stoned approach that is combining these uh, elements of DEA and SFA in a more systematic manner than just a simple average of the efficiency scores. And perhaps importantly, we also then uh, introduced the idea that we, we, uh, we mainly focus on the cost frontier rather than the efficiency scores. And this is somewhat different in the in the stochastic setting because we have this, uh, this uh, uh, random noise term as well. And over the years, there have been uh, significant advances. Also, we have introduced panel data. We have taken uh, uh, non-parametric kernel deconvolution for the for the estimation of the inefficiency term. And currently, we are then in this uh, this uh, the, uh, preparing this work for the for the sixth and seventh regulation period that start in twenty twenty four. So the so the new advances then are something that uh, that uh, have been proposed for the Finnish regulator to be introduced in 2024, particularly this uh, uh, alleviating overfitting. So the cost frontier then that that uh, that uh, that the Finnish regulator has been using uh, since 2016 can be described uh, formally as follows. So. So the focus is here on the on this uh, variable cost called uh, controllable operational expenditure or COPEX. So that's our dependent variable. Uh, but we also recognize that that, uh, that there is uh, this is very capital intensive uh, industry. So we also model the capital stock as a fixed input. And as the output variables, we take into account uh, the energy supply network length and uh, number of use points or so number of users. But we also want to have then, then uh, outages as a bad output and we also want to control for the uh, operating environment and uh, as, the, as the practical measure we use then the ratio of connection points and use points as this kind of a measure of, uh, of how, how um, urban environment is, uh, these uh, local monopolies are operating at. Okay, so that's the the basic rationale of the of the of the cost frontier model that it takes into account much more things than, than most other other regulators are able to do it. And how how do we manage to do it? So so the key idea is that um, that uh, we we draw insights from this uh, efficiency analysis literature. So if you think about this kind of red part, which I will call call DEA inspired part. So there we, we take into account this kind of axiomatic modeling. We, we have, for example, this kind of undesirable output. Uh, uh, we have a uh, fixed input. And it, it, for the, from the perspective of incentives, it's very important that, uh, that this uh, estimated function C satisfies, for example, monotonicity, that, uh, that you, the regulated firms are not re rewarded by, by uh, producing less outputs. Than, than, uh, than, uh, rather than more. So the, for the incentives, it's very important that there's such kind of well, conditions like that monotonicity, also the cost frontier should be convex and, and so on. So, so this is this kind of uh, uh, main advantage conventionally has been, has been of DEA that it certainly satisfies certain kind of axioms. And this is also what we will want to have in this, our, our stone framework. Now then, then consider this other part, which I now will now highlight with the blue color, which which we could call somehow uh, SFA inspired part. So it's likely abusing the notation. Think about the SFA uh, usually has some kind of linear function of something. It could be Cobb Douglas or Translog, but uh, but it's it's a linear function of something. So here here as this linear part, I have this kind of contextual variable C. So the main insights actually where SFA is, is, uh, is SFA literature is really uh, focused on is this uh, composite error term that consists of the inefficiency term U and the noise term V. And because we have a cost frontier, we have plus sign for both of them. Uh, so this U is this kind of asymmetric, uh, um, asymmetric inefficiency term that this is always greater than or equal to zero. And then V is a symmetric uh, noise term. That's the, the distinguishing part. And this uh, SFA literature is mainly focused on this, uh, this, uh, this uh, U and V. So from the conceptual point of view, if you write a model like this, 
Notice that there's actually very little overlap with this SFA part, which I highlighted blue, and the DEA part, which is which is red. So in some sense, they, even though both approaches are um, ultimately aiming at this kind of uh, efficiency scores and, and frontiers, there's actually very little or if any overlap between these two two approaches and and that's why it, it opens the door to actually combine these elements in the in the systematically in the same uh, same uh, same model so so the question then is that how do we estimate it but before proceeding to that i want to highlight i want to quote uh, john maynard keynes in his in his book on on general theory keynes has stated that uh, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping the old ones. So at this point, I would like you to, to uh, forget the old ideas about the DEA or SFA, if you are, are familiar with, deeply familiar with those methods, and uh, try to open your, your, try to be open to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the new idea of, of uh, how, to, how to approach this kind of estimation problem. So, in this stone estimation that I will I will then briefly walk you through next, uh, uh, the main engine in the stone approach is this actually this convex non-parametric least squares or convex regression more broadly. So I, I start here with this kind of little bit more conceptual outlining that uh, that it's just a just a, this kind of uh, standard least squares problem. In the present case, we have a panel data, so so it's a panel data uh, least squares problem. And we have the usual kind of uh, regression equation. Here, I have just had this uh, non-parametric part. I, I just indicated with this blue colored raw, which we which we don't care about so far. But but this is just a usual kind of uh, linear regression uh, problem, except for this kind of non-parametric raw. And how do we model this raw? We introduce a system of uh, equations and inequality constraints, which uh, which then uh, with these in inequalities and e equations, I basically characterize this kind of supporting hyperplanes for this uh, true but unknown unknown uh, frontier function. And uh, with these kind of coefficients gamma and beta, those are these kind of slopes of the supporting hyperplanes. And these inequality constraints then uh, impose convexity and, and monotonicity. And uh, to model the bad output B, then, then uh, we, we can also relax this kind of kind of inequality constraint for the for the bad output B. So that's the first step, and I come back to that a little, little bit later in a bit more simplified uh, setting. So having estimated this kind of convex regression uh, estimator, this is of course then then fitting this kind of uh, uh, piecewise linear curve to the middle of the cloud of points, but then in the sec second step. When we also have this asymmetric inefficiency term, then in the in the in the latest uh, editions of the of the Finnish regulation, we apply the kernel deconvolution method by Hall and Seymour and uh, estimate the expected inefficiency without any parametric assumptions about the about the distribution of the inefficiency term. And then, as the third step in the in this uh, in this regulation, then then uh, we estimate the cost norm. So, so this is this kind of predicted cost uh, given the outputs, uh, capital stock, and and uh, and z variable. Then uh, this is basically we just uh, just use this kind of estimated uh, beta and gamma coefficients and parameter delta, and we just compute this kind of. In in some sense, this is still a, still like a, like a maximization problem, but we can just compute with the with the all observed shadow prices gamma and beta. And, and then take the maximum. So this is very simple to compute and this can be done, for example, just in Excel. So it is of course possible to proceed further. Uh, it is possible to, for example, apply some, some tools of uh, DEA analysis further to these predicted points to, to for example, uh, produce some kind of decompositions of efficiency or find closest targets and so on. So it's not necessary to leave it here. But uh, however, for the purposes of the regulation, this is all that we need as this kind of cost norm that we can then, then in, use in the, in the incentive regulation. So this is the yardstick that the, that the companies then 
need to need to compare their cost and then 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 the incentive is that okay if you're if you have a higher cost than what this uh, in step three we predict then then you have to then uh, then return some of this cost to the or, or in some sense your 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 profit will be lower uh, if you if you manage to operate with lower cost than than this kind of cost norm then you can have a higher profit that's the that's the incentive then so how do we do this kind of stone estimation in practice? So personally, I I I, I started uh, using the stone approach with uh, with uh, with the GAMS modeling language, but recently uh, my my former student and current postdoc uh, Sheng Dai uh, has helped to develop this kind of uh, Python package called PyStone, and this uh, Python package is available, for example, in GitHub. Here is a, here is a link if you're interested. To, you can freely download it and and uh, and use it. And here's also a link to a paper if you want to want to find out more more uh, information. So this Python package is is uh, organized in modules. So basically, you just need to need to upload your data, uh, choose a module that you want to estimate, and you can you can then within the module you can you can for example choose if you want to have variable returns to scale or constant returns to scale. And uh, and uh, you can then apply this package for most uh, most purposes, and and uh, and we of course also keep updating regularly this uh, package, so there will be always new and latest uh, latest uh, modules will be will be made available. And uh, those of you who <clears throat> are not really keen on on uh, computer programming, uh, please note that it's also possible to run this Python code in Stata. So since the Stata sixteen version. There is this Stata Python integration that allows you to to then execute this kind of Python code directly in 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 Stata, uh, for example, in Stata do files. So so that will that makes it very very user friendly nowadays to then apply apply these techniques. So now let's get in more to this kind of uh, new developments of this uh, this uh, this paper. So far, I've mainly covered what is already existing in the literature. So in the recent years, there have been a lot of uh, emphasis on the, uh, a lot of interest in overfitting and how to alleviate overfitting in convex regression. And here are a couple of, couple of uh, recent papers in uh, many of them in, in, uh, in uh, OR journals such as EJOR, but also in statistics journals like, like uh, JASA and JBES. And uh, let me briefly briefly then uh, describe what do we mean by overfitting in the present context. So here are some some kind of examples of what would it mean like uh, like overfitting or underfitting or appropriate fitting. So if you think about uh, about uh, the basic linear regressions, and then of course they have a risk of underfitting that you have a too simple model specification that uh, that uh, you you do not have enough flexibility in the model. On the other hand, if you if you have this kind of uh, highly non-parametric uh, model with including several variables, then there's a risk that uh, that we overfit to the to the data. Now, notice that of course we have these kind of shape constraints like uh, monotonicity and concavity. So those shape constraints already uh, provide some kind of safeguard against this kind of overfitting described in this particular diagram. So, so we do enforce with this kind of monotonicity and convexity constraints that uh, the curve that we are fitting cannot be like completely um, completely uh, wrong type of, uh, type of uh, shape. So, so we don't have this kind of problems like, uh, like even more flexible non-parametric methods might have. But still, there is a possibility, for example, if you think about this uh, middle curve, that there may be, for example, uh, in this um, uh, atypical output output profiles, we might might get uh, get too 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 good fit in this in sample, and that can then deteriorate the the out of sample predictive power. So, if you think about the in practice in the context of the the electricity distribution regulation, then uh, I think this uh, diagram helps to also understand why, why this kind of overfitting can be an issue in this, uh, this context. So here on this diagram, I have described the, 
the um, time uh, development of three output variables over time since 2008 till uh, 2020. So the red curve is the number of users, green curve is network length, and the blue one is the energy transmitted. So, so these are the three output variables that we have in the, in the model. So notice that the number of users and the network length have been increasing over time quite steadily, whereas in the energy transmission, there has been quite a lot of fluctuations uh, depending on the business cycle and, uh, and also the electricity prices. So when we fit the model with some historical data and then we use this kind of, kind of uh, shadow prices in the future, we, we use them with this, uh, these um, shadow prices for the next regulation period of four years, then ob obviously if this output profile is, is changing uh, in the future, then, then we might have this kind of poor fit based on this uh, poor out of sample prediction power based on this historical data. So this is the issue that we want to tackle with this kind of, uh, kind of techniques. So especially now in the recent years, we've had this uh, uh, energy crisis in Europe following uh, Russia's invasion to Ukraine. So it's very, very uh, uh, difficult to predict what will happen in the, in the next uh, four year period, for example, how the energy consumption might, might develop. So this is why this is also the very, very important to alleviate this kind of uh, um, uh, overfitting to the to the specific sample and, and at the cost of the of the out of sample predictive power. So what could be done then? There are there are some basic uh, basic remedies that we can take from the literature. And uh, now, if we think about this kind of convex regression problem that I had. So that, that is the first step of the, of the stone procedure is this, uh, this convex non parametric least squares. So one obvious possibility is to introduce some kind of penalty term for, the, for this, uh, these beta coefficients. So uh, here we have this kind of um, Euclidean norm based, uh, based penalty. Uh, so, so basically, then this this kind of adding this kind of penalty term with some kind of uh, tuning parameter k, which I have indicated here. So, so with some kind of um, positive value for k, then this penalty term will enforce these uh, these uh, beta coefficients, which are these uh, shadow prices. Uh, so those will be forced to be as close as possible to to zero. So that's one possibility. So then, then uh, in, in some this recent uh, JASA paper by Mazumder et al, uh, they called, consider an alternative approach where they where they use so-called Lipschitz constraints. So instead of putting this kind of penalty term in the objective function, they put it put it a similar kind of kind of uh, constraint for this kind of uh, and then the tuning parameter is this L squared. Uh, so this uh, this Euclidean norm of betas is put in the constraint, and so you get some kind of like upper bound that how large this kind of kind of uh, uh, in some sense it's called the Lipschitz norm. So that's another possibility. So then in our our project, then we we started to think that because we want to estimate this kind of kind of uh, cost frontier, so why would we want to enforce these uh, these beta coefficients to close to zero? Uh, that would just then, then mean that we have some kind of constant uh, uh, constant cost, but we have very large uh, differences in the cost. So another kind of augmented Lipschitz constraint could be that we 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 want to decrease the variability in the shadow prices beta, but we but we would then decrease them towards the median. So we we don't allow these um, betas to differ too much from the median beta. And this median is then calculated based on this um, est CNLS estimate. So in some sense, this would be a two-stage procedure. And then, then we also considered an alternative uh, uh, to take some kind of a direct weight restriction. So having estimated these beta coefficients with convex regression, then we can take, for example, the top decile and bottom decile of the shadow prices and then force that these, these beta coefficients must be within this kind of range that we have given. 
So obviously this top decile, bottom decile are just, just arbitrary, but, uh, but that's just one possibility that we have, we have considered. Of course, it can be any, any percentile of the distribution or some other, other weight restrictions that, that you might, might have. But this, uh, this use of the deciles is anyway a very data-driven way to put in, impose this kind of weight restrictions. The question then arises that, uh, okay, which of these uh, alternative remedies works the best? So here we then taken some, applied some insights from the, from the modern analytics literature and, and machine learning. And uh, since we have a panel data, then, uh, then we want to mimic this kind of procedure that also we use in the regulation. So in the regulation practice, we also estimate the cost frontier based on some historical data and then use this estimated uh, frontier uh, as, a, as a yardstick for the next uh, four year period. So to, to test out of sample prediction power, we can use a similar procedure. So we, we take so-called training, training set and we use the first uh, 16 or I guess the 17 years in the, in the data, we call it the training set, which is here indicated with the blue color. So the training set is this, the training set is the data that we used for estimating the shadow prices and other, other model parameters. So then when we, when we proceed to the test set, which is then the, the four-year period or five-year period, a four-year period from 2017 to 2020, we do not uh, change these parameters that we have obtained from the training set. We just use those already, these pre-estimated parameters to then, then form predictions for this red period. And, and then we can test how well these predictions uh, are then, uh, then uh, catching this, uh, this observed cost out of sample. So this is this division between in sample. So in sample, we really, our model is like, uh, like uh, um, we, we try to achieve as good fit as possible in this in sample, but in out of sample, we, we then use these parameters and coefficients estimated from this blue color training set but we do not change those coefficients anymore. So they use them only for the out of sample prediction. And then we use this um, root mean squared error as a used standard measure of, uh, of, um, of, of prediction error. So the smaller, the better. This, uh, this statistic doesn't have some natural interpretation as such, but, uh, but the smaller, the better. So here is then, then what we get, uh, we, we, we have this uh, alternative approaches. So, so we have compared here the, the, the basic CNLS estimator that we have used so far. Then we have this uh, uh, L2 norm penalized uh, CNLS. Then we have this uh, uh, Lipschitz norm constraints uh, relative to zero or relative to median. And then we have the weight restrictions with, uh, with the decile of the distribution or the, the uh, quartiles of the distribution. So let's consider first the uh, uh, in sample fit based on this uh, in sample root mean squared error, and uh, it's not surprising that 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 the basic uh, uh, CNLS estimator will have the the smallest uh, root mean squared error in the training set because it it has least uh, least constraints. It, it has this kind of uh, possibility, best possibilities to uh, fit the curve to the data without any any additional constraints. All of the other alternatives are setting some some constraint to the to the to the curve. So we notice that in sample, uh, the best alternative is this uh, weight restricted CNLS with that with the deciles of the distribution that only has some some small. Um, in precision com in sample compared to the to the basic CNLS. And in this kind of in sample RMS, it, it can be shown that the CNLS will be the best fit, like you cannot cannot get any better fit. Uh, otherwise you have to violate some of the these uh, shape constraints. But what about the out of sample predictive power? So I will then next uh, introduce the out of sample and you can maybe guess which of these uh, uh, you can make some kind of like horse race betting now that which which alternative you think that would be working the best. So here are the results then for this uh, this uh, this out of sample predictive power. So when we use this kind of coefficients estimated uh, for this uh, 
for this training set, then uh, then we then use just those coefficients to 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 uh, predict the, the the operational cost. So notice that this uh, basic CNLS, even though it had the best in sample fit, it has really catastrophic out of sample predictive power. So basically, any kind of uh, kind of uh, um, additional penalty term or constraints we put, uh, the predictive power improves dramatically. And interestingly, the the best out of sample predictive power in this example we achieve with this uh, this old technique of uh, weight restriction. So if we impose this kind of uh, uh, weight restrictions that we limit the variability of this uh, beta coefficients. Uh, to the top uh, be, between the top and bottom decile of, in, of the CNLS estimator, then notice that this uh, out of sample predictive power doesn't deteriorate so much. Of course, it's it's more difficult to predict out of sample than in sample, but but the, the loss of fit is not so dramatic. So based on this kind of kind of, then we recommend that this kind of. Uh, uh, weight restriction approach would be used also in the in the next regulation period. So this kind of kind of um, out of sample, uh, uh, this kind of training set test set setup could be also used for other type of uh, analysis. So so another possibility is also that we can use the model specification testing based on this out of sample predictive power. So one issue that uh, Came to the discussion with the with the with the regulator when we wanted to develop the regulation model further is that that for example what kind of measures of capital stock should be should be used so so far the the regulator has used the replacement value but uh, we currently also discussed the possibility to use the net present value of the capital stock so the main difference here concerns the depreciation that do we take the depreciation of the capital into account or not uh, there's also other other uh, other thing that for example we have discussed about the energy loss but i don't have time to go through that uh, in the present uh, presentation but so when the comparison is about uh, what kind of capital capital stock uh, measure should be used uh, we can similarly use this kind of setup that we we make the training set at look at the in sample fit and also that which which model specification in this case which specification of the capital variable uh, predicts better the operational cost and we can see that uh, that uh, both in sample and out of sample this uh, net present value leads to somewhat better fit than the the, the replacement value so if we if you want to have this kind of uh, uh, better prediction for the for the uh, operational expenditures, then it would make sense to use the, the net present value, taking into account the depreciation of the capital. Uh, on the other hand, it might have some, some other aspects for the incentives, that what kind of incentives the companies have to invest into the network. So, so of course, the difference in the out-of-sample predictive power is not that dramatic uh, if, the, if the replacement value is, uh, seems better from the incentive point of view. But that is then something for the for the regulator to 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 uh, uh, ponder and make a make a decision. So here are the main takeaways for the for the conclusion. So in my presentation, I described some alternative ways to try alleviate overfitting in convex regression, and uh, this uh, this. Uh, Question of overfitting is, is very important and policy relevant in the context of uh, electricity distribution regulator, especially when we use this kind of yardstick regime where this uh, historical uh, historical data and, uh, and um, shadow prices estimated from the historical data are used as yardstick for the next period. So that's why we, we shouldn't uh, only look at the in-sample fit, the out-of-sample predictive power is, is uh, more important. And uh, one particular advantage with this weight restrictions that, uh, that uh, seem to work very well in practice is also that these weight restrictions can be, um, can be also quite effectively communicated to the regulator and also for the regulated firms. So it's, it's quite understandable that, okay, we limit this kind of range of these potential shadow prices to certain, certain values. So then I believe also that this kind of idea of... Uh, 
partitioning the sample to a training set and a test set to evaluate not only for these estimators, but also the, the model specification is something new in this uh, area of, uh, of incentive regulation. So I think that that provides us kind of very, very useful uh, uh, data-driven way to look what, what kind of uh, model specifications, what kind of estimation methods uh, work best in, 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 uh, in, the, in this kind of out of sample predictive uh, power sense. And then, then uh, the usual statistics is the out of sample root mean squared error that, that we can utilize. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will I will hope to prepare some some uh, also a paper out of this this material in the in the near future, but uh, but so far we have only this presentation. If you have any any comments or questions, feel free to contact me. Here's the email on 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 this slide. Thank you and bye bye.